everybody. Welcome to First Chapter Friday. Today's book is Murder is Bad Manners by Robin Stevens. Part 1. This is the first murder that the Wells and Wong Detective Society has ever investigated, so it is a good thing Daisy bought me a new case book. The last one was finished after we solved the case of Lavinia's missing tie. The solution to that, of course, was that Clementine stole it in revenge for Lavinia, punching her in the stomach during lacrosse, which was Lavinia's revenge for Clementine telling everyone Lavinia had come from a broken home. I suspect the solution to this case may be more complex. I suppose I ought to give some explanations of ourselves in, our, in honor of our new case book. Daisy Wells is the president of the detective agency and I, Hazel Wong, <coughs> excuse me, am its secretary. Daisy says that this makes her Sherlock Holmes and me Watson. This is probably fair. After all, I am much too short to be the heroine of the story. And who ever heard of a Chinese Sherlock Holmes? That's why it's so funny to, that it is me who found Miss Bell's dead body. In fact, I think Daisy is still upset about it. Though, of course, she pretends not to be. You see, Daisy is the heroine-like kind of person, and so it should be her that these things happen to. Look at Daisy, and you think you know exactly the sort of person she is. One of those dainty, absolutely English girls with blue eyes and golden hair, and the kind who gallop across muddy fields in the rain, clutching a hockey stick, and then sit down and eat ten cinnamon rolls at tea. I, on the other hand, bulge all over like Biddenbaum, the Michelin man. My cheeks are moony round and my hair and eyes are stubbornly dark brown. I arrived from Hong Kong part way through seventh grade and even then when we were all still shrimps, shrimps for this new casework is what we call the little sixth and seventh grade girls. Daisy is already famous through Deep Dean School. She rode horses, was part of the lacrosse team, and was a member of the drama club. The big girls, which, we, which is what we call the girls at the top grade, took notice of her. And by May, the entire school knew that the head girl herself, Dean, Deep Dean's most important big girl, had called Daisy a good sport. And that is only the outside of Daisy, the jolly good show part that everyone sees. Inside of her is a not so jolly show at all. It took me quite a while to discover that. Daisy wants me to explain what happened this semester up to the time I found the body. She says that is, that is what, is prop, what proper detectives do. Add up the evidence first, so I will. She also says that a good secretary should keep her casebook on her at all, time, all times to be ready to write up important events as they happen. It was no good reminding her that I do that anyway. The most important thing to happen in those first few weeks of the autumn semester was the detective society, and it was Daisy who had begun it. Daisy is all for making up societies for things. Last year, we had the passive, passive, pacifism <laughs> society, dull, and then the spiritualism society, less dull, but then Lavinia smashed her mug during a seance, Beanie faded, and our housemistress, Mrs. Strike, the woman who looks up after us all uh, in our school dorm, banned spiritualism altogether. But that is, was all last year, when we were still shrimps. We can, can't be messing about with silly things like ghosts now that we are grown-up eighth graders. That is what Daisy said when she came back at the beginning of this semester, having discovered crime. I was quite glad. Not that I was ever afraid of ghosts exactly. Everyone knows there aren't any. Even so, there are enough ghost stories going around school to horrify anybody. The most famous of our ghosts is Verity Abraham, 
the girl who accidentally fell off the gym balcony and died the semester before I arrived at Deep Dean. But there are no uh, but there are also ghosts of an ex teacher who locked herself into one of the music rooms and starved herself to death, and a little sixth grade shrimp who drowned in the pond. As I said, Daisy decided that this year we were going to be detectives. She arrived at our school dorm with a small trunk full of books with sinister shadowy covers and titles like Peril at End House and Mystery Mile. Mrs. Strike confiscated them one by one, but Daisy always managed to find more. We started the detective agency in the first week of the semester. The two of us made a deadly secret pact that no one else, not even our doormates, Kitty, Beanie, and Lavinia, could be told about it. It did make me feel proud, just me and Daisy having a secret. It was awfully fun, too creeping about behind the door, the others' backs and pretending to be ordinary when all the time we knew we were detectives on a deadly secret mission to obtain information. Daisy said all four of our detective missions. In that first week, we crept into the other eighth grade dorm and read Clementine's secret journal. And then Daisy chose a sixth grader and told us to find out everything we could about her. This, Daisy told me, was practice, just like memorizing the licenses of every car we saw. In our second week, there was the case of why King Henry, our name for this year's head girl, Henrietta Trilling, because she's so remote and regal, and has such a beautiful chestnut curls, wasn't at prayers one morning. But it only took a few hours before everyone, not just us, knew that she had been sent a telegram saying that her aunt had died suddenly that morning. Poor thing, said Kitty, when we found out. Kitty has the next door bed to Daisy's in our room, and Daisy has designated her a friend of the Detective Society, even though she is still not allowed to know about it. She has smooth light brown hair and masses of freckles, and she keeps something hidden in the bottom of her small trunk that I thought at first was a torture device, but it turned out to be an eyelash curler. She is as crazy about gossip as Daisy, though for less scientific reasons. Poor old King Henry, she hasn't had much luck. She was Verity Abraham's best friend after all, and you know what happened to Verity. She hasn't been the same since. I don't, said Beanie, who sleeps next to me. Her real name is Rebecca, but we call her Beanie because she is very small and everything frightens her. Lessons frighten her the most of all, though. She says that when she looks at a page, all the letters and numbers get up and do a jig until she can't think straight. What did happen to Verity? It was an accident, said Kitty in annoyance. She fell off the gym balcony last year. Come on, Beans. Oh, said Beanie. Of course, I forgot. Sometimes Beanie is quite slow. Something else happened at the beginning of the term that turned out to be a very important indeed. The one arrived. You see, at the end of last year, Miss Nelson, our dull old music and art teacher, retired. She was our deputy headmistress, the second in command to our school principal, the headmistress Miss Griffin. We were expecting her to be replaced by someone else quite as uninteresting. But the new music and art teacher, Mr. Reed, was not uninteresting at all, and he was not old. Mr. Reed had rugged cheekbones and a dashing mustache, and he slicked his hair back with gel. He looked, exa looked exactly like a film star, although nobody could quite agree on which one. Kitty thought Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Clementine said Clark Gable, but only because Miss Clement Cle because Clementine is obsessed with Clark Gable. Really though, it didn't matter. Mr. Reed was a man, and he was not Mr. McLean, our dotty, unwashed old reverend whom Kitty called Mr. McDirty. And so the whole school fell in love with him at once. 
a deadly serious half-secret society dedicated to the worship of Mr. Reed was established by Kitty. At its first meeting, he was rechristened the One. We all had to go about making the secret signal at one another. An index finger raised, right eye winking, whenever we were in his presence. The One had barely been at Deep Dean for a week when he caused the biggest shock since Verity last year. You see, before this semester, the whole school knew that Miss Bell, our science teacher, and Miss Parker, our math teacher, had a secret. They lived together in Miss Parker's little apartment in town, which had a spare room in it. The spare room was the secret. It, I didn't understand when Daisy first told me about the spare room. Now that we are in eighth grade, though, of course, I see exactly what it must mean. It has something to do with Miss Parker's hair, cut far too short to be fashionable, and the way she and Miss Bell used to pass their cigarettes from one to the other during bun breaks. A bun break is a gap in morning class when we are given cookies to eat last year. There were no cigarettes being passed this semester, though, because on the first day, Miss Bell took one look at the one and fell for him as crazily as Kitty did. This was a terrible shock. Miss Bell was not considered a beauty. She was very tucked in and buttoned up and severe in her white lab coat. And she was poor. Miss Bell wore the same three threadbare blouses on rotation, cut her own hair, and did secretarial work for Miss Griffin after school hours for extra pay. Everyone rather pitied her, and we assumed the one would too. We were astonished when he did not. Something had clearly happened between them, Clementine told our class at the end of the first week of the semester. I went to the science lab during bun break, and I came upon Miss Bell and the one canoodling. It was shocking. I bet they weren't really, said Lavania scornfully. Lavinia was part of our dorm, too. She was a big, heavy girl with a stubborn mop of dark hair, and most of the time she was unhappy. They were, said Clementine. I know what it looks like. I saw my brother doing the same thing last month. I couldn't stop myself blushing, imagining stiff, well-starched Miss Bell canoodling, whatever that meant, was extraordinarily awkward. Then Miss Parker got to hear about it. Miss Parker was truly ferocious, with chopped short black hair and furious voice that came bellowing out of her tiny body like a foghorn. The argument was immense. Almost the whole school heard it, and the upshot was that Miss Bell was not allowed to live in the little apartment anymore. Then, at the beginning of the second week of the semester, everything changed again. We could barely keep up with it all. Suddenly, the one no longer seemed to want to spend time with Miss Bell. Instead, he began to take up with Miss Hopkins. Miss Hopkins is our physical education teacher. She is round and relentlessly cheerful, unless you happen not to be good at phys ed. And she marches about the school corridors brandishing a hockey stick. Her bro athletic brown hair always coming down from its fashionable clipped back waves. She is pretty, and I think quite young, so it was not at all surprising that the one should notice her. It was only shocking that he should jilt Miss Bell to do it. So now it was the one and Miss Hopkins seen canoodling in classrooms, and all Miss Bell could do was storm past whenever she saw them, her lips pursed and her glaze freezing. General Dean Pan opinion was against Miss Bell. Miss Hopkins was pretty while Miss Bell was not. And Miss Hopkins' father was a very important magistrate in Gloucestershire, while Miss Bell was nothing important at all. But I could not help being on Miss Bell's side. After all, it was not her fault. The one had jilted her, and she could not help being poor. 
Now that she could not stay in the apartment, of course, she was poorer than ever, and that made us worry. The only thing Miss Bell had to cheer her up was her de deputy headmistress job, and even that was not a consolation that it should have been. You see, Miss Griffin had to appoint a new deputy headmistress, and after a few weeks, the rumor went around that Miss Bell was about to be chosen. This ought to have been lucky once she form was formally appointed, but Miss Bell's money worries would vanish for sure. But all it really meant was that the teachers who were not chosen began to despise her. There were only two others, really, in the running. The first was Miss Tennyson, our English teacher. <laughs> that was her name, really, although she was no relation to the famous one. If you've seen that painting of, the, of Lady Shallot drooping in her boat, you would have seen Miss Tennyson. Her hair is always down around her face, and she has a drippy, she's as drippy as an underdone cake. The second was Miss Lappet, our history and Latin teacher, who is gray and useless and shaped like an overstuffed cushion, but thinks she is Miss Griffin's most trusted advisor. They were both simply fuming about the headmistress job and snubbed Miss Bell in the corridor whenever they saw her. And then the mystery murder happened. I still miss you bunches. So what was that word? <laughs> I don't know anymore. What was that word? Pacifism. Pacifism.